Welcome to the football show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm Peter Martin, Alison McConnell and Tam McMahon is here with me uh, to talk football, to talk World Cup semi-finals and of course domestic football in Scotland which returns in the Scottish Premiership. Really looking forward to not only Thursday night Rangers Hibs but of course all the other matches on uh, Saturday and uh, I think there's some on Sunday as well we can look forward to Tam. It's just going to be magnificent. There's a small matter of the World Cup final yeah, on Sunday's Sunday. World Cup final. I don't think there's any Scottish games on but no, I'm looking forward to the to the Premiership being back, but it seems as if it's been a long time and listen, fans of clubs have been itching for it to come back. You love it, you're domestic, haven't you? Yeah, I'm not a big international fan, yeah. uh, but the World Cup's been good. I thought it's, I think it's been a good World Cup, and if it's France Argentina, I think it would be a it'd be a great final. Yeah, well, we'll get your thoughts on that in a minute, Ali. Hit the subscribe button if you want to join the football family. It's uncensored, unbiased and unmatched. Five days a week, four to five. And if you want breaking football news, download the app. You can visit our website and we've got uh, competitions and quizzes. The still time, I think, actually. You can join it not only for the last semi-final, but for the final itself. Why not try and win yourself some cash prizes in the last few days of our Fandex World Cup competition? You can still join PLZ Soccer on Fandex for our FIFA World Cup 2022 Stock Exchange game. You can play at any stage of the tournament for free and you have the chance to win cash prizes. Buy shares in your favourite team and watch their stock price increase or decrease based on their real life World Cup performances against the expected points tally set by Fandex. You can buy and sell as many teams as you like as often as you like with winners being announced after every round. The PLZ Soccer family are waiting for you on Fandex. Head to plzsoccer.com and click on Fandex World Cup 2022. Still well worthy of that last chance. Good luck with that. We've got a competition with Copa and Grieve Sports later on in the programme. We'll let you know about that. We always like to throw a wee quiz question out too. And here it is today. How many teams have reached the World Cup final after losing their first game of the tournament? Now, there's a cracker. How many teams? Do you want to have a guess, Tom? I've got two in my head right away. Yeah. And both of them are Argentina. So, 1990. Mm -hmm. Lost to Cameroon in the first game and then lost to Germany in so the final. So you're final. going two? I'll go two. Okay, Ali. There's a good one. I think three, possibly. Three. Okay, so three and two. That's the possible answer so far. You can give us your thoughts on it and we'll give you the answer by the end of the programme. So... Uh, good luck with that uh, and thank you to so many of you for joining us on the programme as well um, don't worry about the caption on uh, the football show at the top there you can still click onto the live uh, if you want we've just got a wrong caption on it but nevertheless uh, we're live at uh, Thursday and with a bit of luck uh, you can uh, post engagements on our feed as well give us your thoughts on what you think of not only domestic issues but the World Cup issues as well and thank you to so many of you Brian, Hugh, uh, Josh, Les, Jordan, Martin, Keith, Niall Kane as well and Chris Burke um, all right trips from the M8 car park says Chris Burke that doesn't sound great does hey, it? Burke. yeah so uh, <laughs> back coaching at Kamala that's what I'm just about to say and uh, hi to Ronnie Chapman he says afternoon Peter, Tam and Alison there's so many people uh, joining us uh, from near and far we've had Jamaica Vietnam you name it Canada America New Zealand Australia it's been absolutely brilliant and of course uh, here at home the amount of people who watch the show we really Really do appreciate it. We'll be hearing from Michael Beale, the Rangers manager, more from Lee Johnson as well uh, and of course we'll be looking ahead to the domestic issues on the Saturday. Just one little thing Ali I want to get your thoughts on because we always like to put out something which is very positive about football. Uh, you know the footballers go to the hospitals, they do a lot of things that they don't want recognition for, uh, clubs do it as well. Motherwell are hosting an event, um, not only um, last night, I think, but tomorrow night as well. It's called Meet, Eat, Heat, and it's at the Cooper stand of the stadium from 6 o'clock. And basically, it's the Motherwell Community Trust um, inviting anyone who wants to come along to Fir Park at 6 o'clock um, for warm soup, hot drinks and free Wi-Fi. There's TVs, tablets and computers available to use. Um, you, don't need, you don't need to book. You just need to get along there. And I think... In the current climate, it's just a great idea. Absolutely. I think the, the Motherwell have a fantastic community spirit about them. I think they're a club who are very heavily invested and representative of their community. And I think um, 
initiatives like that are fabulous. I think uh, very important in the current climate, both uh, economically and politically, for, for people to go and even just for a bit of camaraderie, a bit of company, get out of the house if you're sitting on your own, get out, have a chat with people. Uh, I think it's I think it's to be applauded. Yeah, absolutely, um, and well done to Motherwell again. Uh, you seem to never tire of saying that about Motherwell. They're, they're actually in in touch with their fans and the community. Yeah, listen, I'm not a Motherwell fan, but I think in terms of no. <laughs> <laughs> Could have signed with them, as you know, thankfully yeah, never absolutely. for them. But <laughs> what do you mean, thankfully you never? You'd had a good career if you did. I did, I, uh, but not for them. They might have been bust. But <laughs> I, I think Alan Burroughs does a tremendous job in there. Uh, it's not only that, there's the initiatives for season tickets. There was suicide awareness. Um, there was the, the third strip that Tam was proudly modelling the other day. Um, you know, all the money going to, to Samaritans and, 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 and Sam H and teams and stuff like that. So I think that... He's got to be commended, Alan Burroughs and the whole board at Motherwell. They really look after their fans and, the, as Ali said, the community spirit they've got in there is uh, fantastic. I wonder if Tam Cowner popped in. He'll be there. Yeah, yeah. If only for the free food. And then if you miss it, you can always see him on Instagram eating it as well. Have you ever met a guy who actually posts <laughs> so many different meals? It defies me. His whole Instagram looks as if it's a massive freebie of starters and main courses, isn't it? That's life goals. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, OK, uh, our menu for today is all about football. Hopefully you can contribute as well. Hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. There are so many people really enjoying your content and uh, I can tell you, obviously from the 23rd onwards, we're going to have a little break um, to the 3rd of January because we're going to be in the holiday period, but we will be showing you the best of uh, over the course of this year. We'll also be looking back because it's 10 years Ruffy and I uh, launched this programme. Can you believe it? 10 years. There's, there's a great book to follow it, Ali. Um, you might want to write it because <laughs> I think I'm going to be more honest than Ruffy was in his autobiography, but um, 10 years of unbelievable guests, a lot of fun and some people who um, are no longer with us that we wish were still by our side um, so we'll be showing you some clips on the, the best of 10 years and the best of the last 12 months which has been amazing Tam and Ali I mean I've thoroughly enjoyed the, the, the crack the, the team of had nights out we've thoroughly enjoyed the football as well yeah, it has. I think, obviously, going back to the COVID period as well, it was difficult. We're all stuck in the house. Uh, you probably got a few laughs with people setting up cameras and Wi-Fi cutting out. And remember, my Christmas lights went off. But <laughs> uh, no, the last year, it's been great back in the studio uh, here uh, and, and being together. I think that's the main thing. You know, it was what, two, a year and a half, two years of COVID where everybody was sitting in the house and locked down. So uh, I think it's been a, a, a great period for, for PLZ over the last year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ali, I just need to confirm, how long have you been with us now? He says he's four years. Are you longer? I think I'm about four years too. Yeah. I was with you prior to COVID. Yep. Uh, I think, I think you are for 2019, roughly. Right. 2018, 2019. Yeah. So. That's, yeah. That's, 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 incidentally, that's when the ratings went through the roof and me and Ali came on board. Absolutely. Have to we're sinking you know. like a stone until we come on board. Absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll talk about the badge kisser later because he's on the best <laughs> off as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about Messi because... I just thought last night I was hoping that Argentina would just go up through the gears again and boy did they with that man the number 10 Messi was amazing wasn't he Yeah I thought um I thought you I, I thought Argentina as a whole produced their best performance of the tournament I think uh, it looks indicative of them peaking just at the, the right time ahead of the final um, but I thought Messi was unplayable last night I really did and I thought it was a penalty I have to say I know there's been the a bit of chat about it. I thought it was a penalty, yeah. um, but his his assist uh, was something special. Yeah, absolutely magnificent. And and the great thing about it, uh, Niall says Messi is the goat. It's such a great argument. It's gathering so much pace. That is he the greatest of all time? Has he moved up the table? If he wins the World Cup, is he the goat or? Um, does he move a position up in, in, in some people's reckoning of an older uh, generation up close to Pele or beyond Maradona? Give us your thoughts on it. It's, it's an ongoing uh, debate. It's not an argument. It's a debate over people who have enjoyed certain players and certain generations, Tom. Yeah, everybody will have their own favourites. I think it's a generational thing. You know, if you were slightly older than me, I think you'd maybe say Pele, Maradona. Um, but my, my era, uh, from maybe... 90s on, I think that Messi's been the best that I've seen. So, I think if he wins a World Cup, he's won everything. You know, he's, he's he need a bigger studio, a bigger yeah. house to for his trophies. So, I think that will complete him uh, as a player. He might bow out. Bow out uh, oh, on that. I think he will. I think he'll bow out on that. And uh, 
I just hope he's one game away now. I just really hope for Argentina. And they've been playing tournament football, knockout tournament since the first game. Yeah. Uh, I think that was probably a good thing that they lost that first game. Mm. They have... There's been no, you know, overconfidence or arrogance or complacency. They've had to win every game since then, and they've done that. And as Ali said, I thought they peaked last night. I thought they looked a real strong unit. Yeah. They, a bit of everything in there. Their defenders are no nonsense. You know, some frighteningly bad tackles, to be honest. They, I think Romero as well in the first half, but Alvarez makes some tick as well. He runs in behind. He leaves that space for Messi. So they've got a wee bit of everything in there, and they, I just hope they've got one more game to, to complete it and do it. Yeah, I, I think for the for certainly for the sentimental value, I think there's a lot of people out there just are willing Messi over the line. The one joy of it all, though, is <clears throat> I can remember a time in the Champions League where people were were criticising him because he walked about. But when he walks about, fine. But he's walking about looking constantly. I mean, he looks and he he, he just wants the right space before he explodes. Yeah, I think you would underestimate him at your peril. I think. Um I think when he's on it, when he's in the mood, as you saw last night, I think there's very few people can get close to him. And he's at an age now where I think he's quite sensible in how he plays. He's not going to run about for 90 minutes. I think you have to pick and choose what you're doing in a game. You have to play with your head almost once you get into the latter the latter chapters of your career. And I, I think you've seen that. I think, um, I think he's a clever player. But I, I think... He looks like he's enjoyed himself. Yesterday, I thought uh, he was all smiles. Last night, enjoyed the moment. I think he enjoyed the adulation of the stadium and the, taking the acclaim of the, the Argentina support. And I think they very much look like the favourites just now to go and win it, regardless of what happens this evening, whether it's France or whether it's Morocco. I think uh, Argentina look as though it's, it's, it's destined for Messi that he goes and wins it now. Yeah, um, uh, the, some of the fans last night, the pictures <coughs> of the Argentina fans celebrating was uh, absolutely magnificent. I mean, because they had stayed in the stadium, uh, they were all celebrating as well, which was, was just absolutely brilliant to see them. I mean, I think I think there's more and more of them, obviously, hoping now they can get a ticket. That's going to be the hottest ticket in town, the World Cup final, but the, the Argentina fans after the game were brilliant. Yeah, I think a lot of the games I've seen like home games for Argentina. Uh, I think the only one that wouldn't be a home game would be Morocco. I think Argentina and Morocco have had the best fans there, the most fans. And I read that the Moroccan FA have, have bought 30,000 tickets for the Moroccan fans yeah. to go to the game tonight. So again, that'll be like a home game for Morocco. So OK, you're wanting France in the final in Argentina. I think that's great for the purists, but from a, a fan spectacle, I think Morocco, Argentina, both sets of fans have been outstanding and that would be an electric atmosphere. Have you ever gone to a game, Ali, um, before you obviously worked in journalism with the with the troops and maybe painted your face? Have you ever painted? Oh, no, that's never. Not my face. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, just to, I just see people painting their face. I mean, the uh, Senegalese fans, well, some of them had taken their tops off and they'd gone painted Senegal right across yeah. 10 of them, or, uh, you know, or how many letters. Over how many letters. Year. Yeah, well, I was going to say there's not much of that year, no chance of it at the moment. But I, I think all of that adds to the colour of it. Um, and then uh, I don't know if you've noticed this. Tam, but as soon as the producer spots somebody who's on the big screen, and as soon as that person notices they're on the big screen, Bush, he just hits the button and moves away to uh, somebody they look, else. They look up and have a wave, didn't they, and see they're on the telly, but no, I, th I, th I think it'll be, I think it's another good game tonight. I think if Morocco score first, um, I think they have got a great opportunity to beat France. I'd like to see France, you know, being tested. Yeah. I think if France score early doors, yeah. Morocco need to come out. I think the pace that France have got and the ability in the forward areas will crush them, but I think it'll be a tight game. Yeah, just out of curiosity, penalty last night. Um, I mean, there are, there are a few who have debated whether it was a penalty. Oh, or I thought he took him out. It's a stonewaller. I thought it was a penalty. If that's a foul, if that happens anywhere else on the pitch, I think it's obstruction, isn't it? Yeah. I thought it was a penalty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and then the referee have got in the expert. <laughs> Who actually gave his expert opinion? They were saying, "No, nah, you're, you're, there's not a penalty. Yeah. What's the point in having that guy on then? Yeah. I know you can agree, disagree, but if he's giving you the rules, I, I think he's, he was. Yeah, I tell you one thing though, he, he takes a penalty brilliantly because even what although you, even although you know he comes lefties like to come across their body oh, time. Perfect. It's just right in the top corner. And he's missed. It, he, I think at the start last night he's missed twenty eight percent of his penalties. So that's quite a lot. That's quite high actually for a player of his ability. But yeah. ruthless, right in the roof of the net. No chance for the goalkeeper and. One more game for him. One more game. Come on. Yeah, absolutely. One more game and then immortality. Um, and this PLZ sweep. Yes, well, you've got Argentina, I've got France. Um, money so goes to money. I actually, no, stick. I actually I hope you win it. I actually want you to win it. Right, okay. I want Argentina to, so to the staff, win. So do the staff, because I might get the fiver back. <laughs> 
<laughs> only joking, you're getting nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but of course, uh, the one good thing about it, apart from anything else, is I see great similarities. I'm going to ask you the question about where he is in your line because everybody's commenting on it here. Now, I must read out a few of them um, because lots of people are saying, listen, um, if... You know, Hugh Scott saying how good was Messi last night, uh, and especially that when he left Guardiola for uh, for uh, that little burst of pace. Uh, Sean, who's posted this about three times, says Ronaldo's ninety nine percent the best player in the world. The one. Um, well, he doesn't say, but I would imagine he's thinking of the Portuguese. Um, over and above that, uh, lots of people are saying, "Well, it's, it's all about opinions. This is the joy of it all." Um, uh, you know, lots of people saying, "If if he wins it, then he he, he just elevates himself." If he wins it is he the greatest of all time Ali I think he's certainly in that company I know I he's in the he's company Ali don't on Ali get on that on hey, by the way can I just say something you've, sat, you've seat. sat in Ruffy's seat and suddenly there's this kind of a scale. I think it's very difficult to to look at cross generational talents and see where they are in terms of yeah. a try your best then <laughs> but hey, I think I think there would be a fairly compelling argument to say there is um, make it is an interesting argument, though. Make an argument. Um, I think he's done everything. Yeah. I think if he goes and wins the World Cup, what more could he have done in his career? I yeah, think. Uh, so I think he's probably up there. My son no, and I. No, uh, no, I know Joe. I know your son Joe <laughs> is uh, arguing with you on it, but I just need an answer from you. I, I think. Is a goat. Yes. Wow, God. That was like a body of a stone. That was unbelievable. <laughs> seat, Shall we tell you something? She'll be coming in in a golf jersey next and, 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 you know, and hanging about with you. Uh, that From the bargain rack. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that was, that's the longest I've ever had to wait for you an hope, opinion you, from you Alan. Can, you can ask You're me. Go anyway. Oh, I mean, 100%. Yeah. He is the best of all time if he wins it. And I'll actually cry. I'll greet in the house yes. if he wins it. I will. Yeah. Uh, well, if he lifts that world well, cup, can I just say something? Now, uh, David Gemmell says Cruyff was a better player. Um, and also, Sned says uh, Maradona was better than Messi. Um, well, l- let me tell you this. The, the, the one thing I would say to you all um, is that, I mean, you know what I'm going to say here. The reason uh, I would indulge anybody in this argument, if you can, if you're under 40 and you've got access to uh, Pelly's back catalogue, um, all I would say to you is this, I get the fact that 1,230 odd goals, a lot of them were uh, Brazil and Santos playing in friendlies, um, but he's certainly up at I think 800 odds um, officially through FIFA um, as one of the top goal scorers. But I would indulge you, uh, you know, in this argument as well uh, to get involved in it because Pele, as a 17 year old, was in the World Cup final. Um, he was also the youngest player ever to score in a World Cup final. Still stands today against Wales in 1958. And at 17 years of age, he was selected by the best Brazil side of that era. They were full of talent, but they demanded that the 17-year-old, who was so good, gets in the side. And at 17, he scores two in the World Cup final, impressive, which, which impressive. is unbelievable. And he goes on to win three World Cups. And, he, and by the way, his his... He couldn't move out of Brazil because mm. they declared him a national treasure. So he's he's in that country winning everything that you can with Santos. And then when you look back over FIFA and all the awards that came his way, he was one of the icons with Muhammad Ali for me of the 20th century. I would agree with that. And you know? I think uh, he comes across as, as, or he came across as incredibly humble. I think yes. still always. You see him um, even on, on social media congratulating players like uh, I saw him talking to Mbappe and, and things like that he always seems he seemed like an encouraging man never threatened by people maybe uh, coming close to, to achieving similar things I think sometimes if you've made a, a mark in the game you maybe don't like comparisons or you, you maybe bristle when people are saying yeah. you know uh, who's I'm glad you said that so. whereas <laughs> I think uh, I think he's encouraged that I think he's welcomed it I think uh, He's been an incredibly generous man from the outside with his praise and encouragement of other players. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Ali, because um, Gary Hawthorne says you can't compare Maradona and Pele to Messi, mainly because the ball's lighter now, faster now, makes scoring and passing easier. Um, We've had the argument that the pitches were heavier, you could boot somebody and really give them... If you think some of the tackles were tasty last night, Claudio Gentili 
took tackling to a whole new art because he made sure that his first tackle was just above your knee and then he worked his way down. So, I mean, these these guys could get booted from pillar to post in, Me in Maradona's day and especially in Pelly's day because, as I mentioned to you before, Tam, he was booted out of the 1966 yeah. World Cup. The game's totally changed since then. You know, I, I watch old clips from time to time on YouTube. If I can't get to sleep or whatever, I just stick it on and... The game's totally changed. There was more Tanner Ball players, as they call it there, wingers, boy, taking two and three players on. You don't see that now. You know, it's all athleticism, pace, power, and probably not for the better, for the, for the, for the spectator. They wanted to see individual brilliance, and you've seen that with some of the guys you mentioned, but uh, I think when, we, when, you t when you take it all into account, you know, the best I've seen is Messi, by, by a mile, uh, but I'm, I'm 41, so there yeah. might be guys at 51, 61 who... I think Pelé and Maradona was better, and I, I, I totally appreciate their opinion because yeah. they were a different era. Can you give me your? Yeah, I know it's tough. Can you give me your top five in order? Uh, Messi, Maradona, Ronaldo, Brazilian, Ronaldo, Portuguese, and Ronaldinho. That's your top five. Well, that's that, that was a good call from a forty-one-year-old. It's that's all. It's all. It's all relevant to what you've witnessed. That's uh, good, um, Ali. Um, Martin Boyle, sixth. <laughs> Brilliant, Sam. Uh, and yourself, five. And you've had the argument with Joe. You must have five in your head. I think Pelly's probably still for me. Obviously, I never saw Pelly. I'm not much. I'm not much older than Tam. I think Pelly just. I think Pelly's probably number one or Messi. Number I think one Messi waiting wins. to be replaced. Potentially, you just I said don't that have 10 minutes lists. ago. I don't have lists. I think it, I think you should be privileged to enjoy watching the players of your generation. Know, I don't think you that. need to that. have the Listen, who is the best. See when I was looking at the best. Let me give you a bit of advice, Ali. See when I was looking at the best off shows over the last ten years, I sat and laughed out loud <laughs> at the one to one I had with Hugh McIlvanny, possibly the greatest sports writer Indeed. of his generation, and he could rhyme off who was the best boxers one, two, three, four, and five. He could also do it with footballers. I mean, that's we love lists. I've got people on here giving uh, somebody Matty's giving it Wayne Rooney, not for playing football, may I add, but nevertheless, uh, Puskas, very good, says David Gemmel. Jimmy Johnston's David getting Gemmel's mentioned. clearly 70 odd. David Cruyff was pure, pure David football. David <laughs> <laughs> Ali. <laughs> Puskas. <laughs> Ali. Puskas is a great football. I mean, was that 50s? Yeah, Puskas left peg. Um, Ali, have you got five? I would say Pelly, Messi. Maradona. Uh huh. There's three. Two to go. Ronaldo, Portuguese. All oh, right. Okay. Tommy Fatma. Yep. And the fifth one. I think my fifth one might be Cruyff. Cruyff. Okay. There you are. Is that the Brazilian Ronaldo in there? Uh, well, listen, uh, this is the other thing about it. You, you, <laughs> you, it's the joy. Um, tonight's game. I lost our nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You do. You? <laughs> we love this. Um, by the way, I can just say, I've got to read this. You've got Douglas in your top five. To, to, honestly, Tommy Adams has just said... Have you got Douglas? You haven't you? Don't, I haven't got Douglas. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely love him. I cannot help it, by the way. I've, by love way. him. He's your favourite player ever, isn't he? Oh, I love him. Absolutely. Two, two, of my, two of my favourite players of all time are Kenny Douglas and Danny McGrain. I make, I make no apologies to anybody because... You put Danny McGrain in your world 11. I did. Ahead of Do you know Cafu. why? Do you know why? Because, quite simply, Danny McGrain could beat five players and then cross the ball over for Ken Douglas to score. I mean, he was that good. Douglas is just a genius. Uh, it's as simple as that. But um, Tommy Adams, Tommy, I know you're watching, Tommy. I haven't got Douglas in my top five, although I was tempted. What's <laughs> uh, your top five? <clears throat> oh, my top five is, is Pelly. If Messi wins the World Cup at the weekend... Um, I don't know if you see that when Barcelona do it, Tam. When Barcelona have a player who's come to the end of his career, they put all the trophies that they've won out in the park and they get a photograph. <laughs> Some size of park. <laughs> Can you imagine it? I mean, it, honestly, and I think Busquets and Xavi, uh, when they, well, I think Xavi, when he got his photograph taken, you were like, wow, World Cups, uh, Copa del Rey, Champions Leagues, they were all there. And it was like 35 something trophies. So, if you do, think, do Maradona, you know that? Do you know that when I finished my career at Limerick, they done that? Yeah, and they put all my stuff on a Sabuto pitch. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not surprised. But can you, can you imagine, just Messi, just putting all his stuff out there and Ballon d'Or? Oh. I lot. think it's actually an incredible photograph because the the visuals of it, the optics of it, give you a real you know, really bring home and, and take into focus yeah. exactly his achievements. And I, I, I've got Pelly. then I've got, Me I'll put Messi in if he wins the World Cup on Sunday, but Maradona third, 
Um, and then from there, uh, I mean, I've got to pick Cruyff oh, okay. and I've got to pick Ronaldinho. Eh, eh, Ronaldo, sorry, the Portuguese. But, and I'm a big fan of Ronaldo, the Portuguese, and I'll tell you why. And I'm a big fan of Ronaldo, the Brazilian. I think he's closely in sixth is because, quite simply, Ronaldo, for all the people that don't like him now and the haters who hate him, Ronaldo, for me, is the epitome of what every person who wants to actually excel at the top of their game, mm. he's worked so hard for it, his contribution right across so many. Um, just never took to him as a person. I know, I people mean. don't like him as a person, but I'll tell you right now, when he hangs up his boots, you watch the people who reassess what that boy's contributed. I, I, I just think he's fantastic. And I, can I just say, Edward McConville, thank you for this, because would you believe when I was a kid, Ali, You'll never believe this. This is a mad story, right? But when I was a kid, Edward McConville's mentioned somebody here. I'm going to mention him. When I was a kid, David Cooper used to run, I think it was a squash or a badminton club. And I used to DJ at his clubs when I was a, when I was a teenager. And I would DJ and he'd give me the wedge for doing it. And then he'd give me 20 quid for myself. And I used to think, David Cooper's just magic. Give you 20 quid when you were, when you were 14 or 15. You're 20 quid, Tom. 60s. Was I mean, 60s, that's a lot of money back then. Uh, yeah, <laughs> David Cooper. <laughs> but he was such a great... <laughs> David Cooper's a great player. Yeah, he Fantastic. was class. He yeah. was class. <laughs> so there you are. Thanks for mentioning that, Edward, because um, we do have uh, lots of memorabilia and Davey's never far away from our uh, memorabilia in here, the stuff that we have. So, And it, it, lots of people are mentioning uh, Zidane. Pele, Di Stefano, Maradona, Messi, Zidane. Um, I think Cruyff is a player to win three European Cups and, of course, what he did um, at Barcelona was amazing. Uh, tonight, Morocco, France, can you see an upset? No. No? I don't think so. Um, if there's to be any chance of it, I think Morocco probably have to score first and then frustrate France. Um, I think France will be too good. Yeah. Yeah, they've got, they've got two or three areas which I think... No, I'm not only worrying them, I'm doing my classic uh, BBC ITV let's look ahead to see about the final, but they've got too many players that I think can cause Morocco problems, you know, although Morocco's defence has been super. I think it depends what team Morocco put out. I think they were they were gasping at the end of the, the last game, Portugal. I think they got, they got a man sent off. Uh, I think they've got injury problems at the back. It, it depends what sort of team they put out, but if they score first... They have proven in this tournament that they are tight and hard to break down. So the first goal in this game, as, as, as in any game, is, is huge. But I think in this game, you know, it might spook France a little bit if Morocco gets it. But if France gets it, I think they'll win comfortably. Yeah. Uh, the current World Champions, of course. Um, this uh, would be their seventh World Cup semi-final. They lost the first three um, before eventually 98, 2006 and has anybody ever won it back to back the World Cup, Peter? Uh, that's a question. That's it. Well, Brazil, 58-62. I think uh, uh, the, the first one was won by Uruguay. You know, I usually have that list that it can mm. rhyme off, you know. Um, there was actually, a, you, you'll think this is pretty sad, but when I was a kid, I could rhyme off every FA Cup and Scottish Cup winner from, <laughs> from about 1970 onwards. That's really sad, isn't it? You hate lists, don't you, Ali? Eh? That's what kind of, that's you're sitting next to a geek. Um, who loves all these things? Vanini, did you ever get chewing gum cards? Is that too? Were you too young for that? No, I did. I, I used yeah, to get the stickers. Yeah, the, stickers. the first first one I can remember was ninety. Yeah, I'd have been nine. Yeah, so 1990 World Cup collecting the stickers and all that, and had the Germany strip stickers. <laughs> I remember stickers. Yeah, remember. Your, your boy would. Joe uh, and I haven't been to yeah. match attacks and tops, right, I think they call them. Spending a fortune, like spending 700 Ali, I kid you not, in the, in, the, in the football cars, you used to get chewing gum with them. Right. You used to get the five cars and then you get a chewing gum uh, in there as well. Um, but then as time went on, the cars get smaller and smaller. Um, so, France for you? Penny need geek here. Uh, France, 2-0. Two OK. 2-1. Yep, okay, I'll, I'll go, th I'll go, yeah, I think I'm going to go 2-0, um, too much for them. Uh, as far as <coughs> retro, people who are older than 41, um, you might like some of the retro shirts, we've got six vouchers to give away uh, in our competition with Greaves and Copa, have a look. PLZ Soccer has teamed up with our friends at Greaves Sports and Copa to offer you the fabulous chance to win one of these World Cup retro shirts if you enter our World Cup hat-trick competition. All you have to do is tell us who you think will win the World Cup, finish top goal scorer and who will be declared player of the tournament. The person who gets all three correct will go into a draw to win one of six vouchers to choose their very own Retro World Cup shirt from the Greaves Sports website. And if you don't get all three correct, then don't worry. You can still subscribe to our YouTube channel for a chance to win. 
to enter simply submit your answers in the feed below and if you want to double your chances of winning then make sure you subscribe to PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. The winner will be announced on the day of the World Cup final. Good luck. Yeah, six of them, uh, the vouchers to get your retro shirt. It's uh, well worth it. Everybody likes wearing them. Um, did you ever wear um, any colours if you were going to a game before you get into it, played football? No. No, no, no not at all. Um, but it's funny you should say that because some, a lot of people don't like to, to wear colours to some of the games just out of the fear of um, I doing? getting a <laughs> That's exactly it. It's changed a lot in recent times. I think if you look at older photographs of, of crowds in stadia, yeah. the, uh, you see maybe people wearing scarves, but it was actually quite rare for people to wear replica tops. It's a fairly modern thing. Yeah, it is actually. You're absolutely right, I, I, Ali. Um, it certainly gathered pace, I think. I think probably replica top started to gather pace, maybe a seventies yeah. uh, onwards. You know. Um, by the way, the World Cup winners: Uruguay, the first one; Italy, France, Brazil. Um, I think this is uh, the hosts of them all. As far as the uh, winners of, you know, I know, just actually thinking, you know, <laughs> I, was I was looking I've at myself. I've seen Switzerland. I know, I know, I think wow. that's not right. <clears throat> but the winners. <laughs> I'm just going to check this because uh, this is this is the key to it all. Anyone won it back to back. Has anyone won it back to back? Uh, and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, who has won it? Uh, the winners of it. Here's the champions. Italy, 34 and 38. So well done to anybody who got Italy who won it 34 and 38 back to back. Brazil won it 58 and 62. Um, looking at everybody else then, and you're saying to yourself, anybody else won it back to back? And it's been a long period where, no. Simple as that. So there's only two countries that have won it back to back. That'd be some achievement for the French French players. To have, two, to have two World Cups. Yeah, phenomenal. Uh, okay, let's go domestic. Michael Beale talking, getting ready for his first big game, his first competitive game in charge of Rangers. Will there be a different style in this? Um, here's how the whole thing's shaping up domestically. Here's the fixtures to look forward to. And the first one you'll see on that fixture list is, of course, uh, Rangers against Hibs on Thursday. Then it's Aberdeen Celtic, Hearts Kilmarnock, Livingston Dundee United, Motherwell St Mirren and Ross County against St Johnston. So we're back to domestic football. Tam loves it. Rangers against Hibs doesn't get any better. It's going to be a humdinger. And the reception for Michael Beale will, su will be superb at Ibrox. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, he was a very popular appointment on the back of uh, of uh, Giovanni Van Bronckhurst's just disappointing end at Rangers. I think there was there was a bit of ambiguity about the appointment uh, on behalf of the Rangers fans at first, but I think the first kind of press conferences, the result on on Saturday, I think people are, are very much behind them. It'll be interesting to see where it goes from here on in. Yeah, um, we sent a reporter, <laughs> Kerry Pollock, out there today to see what the Rangers manager had to say. I'm here at Rangers Training Centre at Money. Yep, we'll come back to Kerry uh, very shortly um, and get her thoughts on Michael Beale. We'll find out about that uh, shortly. But the one thing that he has to do is stamp his authority on that Rangers side, what they're going to play like, how they're going to play, the players that he's going to use. It's his call now. Yeah, it is. Listen, it's his head, his head on the block, so to speak, and uh, he'll be judged on results moving forward. I think you will see a, a Rangers team that plays at a higher tempo. I think Gio is more possession-based, you know, try to break teams down. I think under Gerrard, Rangers were, were aggressive, you know, in the press. And uh, there's not a lot of teams domestically that can handle that press bar Celtic. So if you go and press defenders, you know, high up the pitch, you know, at St Mirren's, at Hibs and teams like that, they'll give you the ball back. So I think that's going to be key for Rangers. Uh, the five subs, again, makes it a lot easier. You know, 60, 70 minutes, they can bring four or five international players on. So I think you'll see a different identity from Rangers uh, going forward from Thursday night. Yeah, um, Ali, what do you expect? Do you expect a, uh, Tam has mentioned the high press? Is that what we? I think that's got to be the the game that I was at against St Mirren before Giovanni Van Bronckhorst got sacked. I just thought Rangers were slow and so paced. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think he's already mentioned that the the squad aren't as fit as what he wants them to be, given the the kind of football that he wants them to play, which would suggest that he's going to go for a, a kind of high pressing style. I think it's interesting. I think um, the club clearly have a lot of faith in him, given the length of contract that he's been given. I think what supporters will want to see across the, the opening few games is a, is a team that are capable of challenging Celtic, that are capable of, of putting up a bit of fight, of restoring some pride between now and the end of the season. I think realistically, 
few of us would anticipate that, that a Celtic team that have been fairly formidable in a domestic context would would squander a nine-point lead. But I think if you're a, were a Rangers fan and you want to see a team that's at least capable of asking questions and giving them a run for their money. OK, um, listen, uh, we'll, we'll give uh, Michael Beal and Kerry one more go. And if they don't, then we'll get it online on our website and uh, on our app as well for you. But Kerry was out there today at the Rangers Training Centre, I promise you. I'm here at Rangers Training Centre at Murray Park today where Michael Beale has just addressed the media ahead of his first competitive game here in charge at Rangers against Hibs tomorrow night. But the big question here today was how quickly can the new boss turn things around and close that nine point gap between themselves and Celtic at the minute? Michael Beale says that big changes have to be made here at Rangers. And I have to change the feeling around the club. I need to change the, the valuation of our players is probably not where it should be right now. Some individual players because of how the whole team's perceived. The team's the vehicle. The club's been in a fantastic place maybe five or six months ago going into European final and 12, 18 months ago win the league unbeaten. The players' valuation was much higher in those moments. I think at the moment it's not good for anybody associated with Rangers. The fans who feel it the most, the players as well, and then myself and the staff. So I think between now and May I need to change that. And Rangers fans will be delighted to hear that their new boss wants to have more of an attacking threat on the pitch, perhaps linking up a certain partnership that fans have longed for. Yeah, I certainly feel that players are chomping a bit to have an opportunity and, and obviously whoever I pick tomorrow, there'll be nine players on the bench who are unhappy and maybe one or two outside the squad. But they have to win the shirt in training. No, nothing's given. I'll only rotate if I feel that someone adds value to the starting eleven. Um, I certainly want to play with two strikers at times and... You should expect that in the coming games that we play with two strikers. Mm, that's good news. I think it is. I think when you're at Celtic Rangers, you've, you've got to play with two strikers at home. You know, I think that you're, you're going to dominate the ball. You're going to get crosses into the box. Um, it seems to be that, that you know it's, it's four two three one just now, or four three three with two wide men and maybe a striker and one off. But I think if, if Rangers get back to that four four two or whatever three five two, and they've got the two main strikers. Cholak Morelos, then I think that they would both score goals and link up well with both different types of players. So I think the Rangers supporters will be looking to see that, particularly at home domestically, eh, when teams come to Ibrox. And we're about to find out in the very near future, Ali, whether you can convince a Ryan Kent or an Alfredo Morelos to <coughs> sign a new deal. Um, he certainly wants to add value to players, and by adding value, they need to perform. I just wonder if they're going to take the hit on either of those players and let them go to the summer. Yeah, I think the ball, I think when it gets to this stage, it's the, the players who are, are really in control of it. I think the ball's in their court now. I think um, they'll probably want to assess what options are there, wait and have a look. And if there's a, an appealing club comes in, an attractive move that's on the table, I think, um, you know, I think they'll take it. I don't think, I think that's how football works. I think uh, there's no great surprise there about that. I have to say, I think it's probably advantageous to Rangers for them to move on. I think... Um, I know Michael Beale suggested that he thinks he can get the, both, the, the best out of both of them. I'm not sure you've seen the best out of both of them for quite some time. I think when there's a new manager comes in, if you want to, to bring in a new chapter, I think maybe you take the hit and you reinvest that money somewhere, the salary levels, etc. You reinvest it and you bring in some freshness into the squad, just shakes things up a bit and um, you maybe inject something a bit different into the squad. Yeah, I, I think that will be a collective decision on the basis that the board might look and say, let's cash in. If, I, I don't see them letting them go to the summer. It depends. I on think they get a lot of flack for that. It depends on the, the, the offers that come in, the bids. You know, if it's if it's poultry, if it's 200 grand, 400 grand, 500 grand, I don't think Rangers would sell any of them for that. I think they'd rather let the contract run out. And, uh, Do you think he needs to win a trophy? This season? Yeah. Uh, I don't think he needs to win one, no. I think that um, I think he needs to show from now to the end of the season that there's been progress, the, the team's getting better. Um, I think if he does that and they close the gap on Celtic in the league and maybe get to the finals, then I think there'll be hope. You know, look at Stephen Gerrard when he first came in, never won anything. But there was clear progress every season. Yeah. Uh, so I, th I don't think he needs to win anything this season, but next season, obviously, I think he does. Uh, what about I think it depends. I think, uh, I think if there were to be disappointing cup defeats, I think it does invite a bit of pressure before next season because, again, as we've spoken about, I think you would anticipate that, that Celtic go on and win the league. I think uh, I think even if you don't win them, I think you have to 
have a fairly successful run in both the League Cup and the and the Scottish Cup. Yeah, um, well, listen, we're going to wait and see how the team uh, reacts to Michael Beale. Obviously, uh, you know, when you're at a club like Celtic or Rangers, the fans demand you have to win uh, something. But th the point I'm making is, do they cut him some slack on the basis that he's got that time to try and build his own team? Because it's not his team at the moment. Um, but We'll wait and see how they, they develop. What are they going to play like at uh, Ibrox against Hibs? Here's what the uh, High Bees manager, Lee Johnson, is expecting. Michael's got a, a strong philosophy. He, he had a strong philosophy uh, in the work that he'd done with Stephen. He's then moved to QPR, had a very short stint um, there, and, and obviously got the, the, the dream move, if you like, for him because he'd been at Rangers before and he knows the club inside out. So. He will have a way of playing of which, of course, we think uh, we, we have a very good knowledge of because we do the research, but they've also got very good players, Rangers. I'm, I'm really curious to see what's going to happen with Hibs coming out of this. Is, if you're talking about one club with an absolute nightmare of the next four games, it's Hibs, and I really feel as if we're about to just go back into that zone of, is Ron Gordon going to just go back to type and sack another manager? <clears throat> the next four games are massive. Uh, you know, I looked at the table the other day, they're five points off of third and they're five points off of second bottom. So the next four results dictate, you know, are you going to be pushing for third or are you going to be in a relegation battle? You know, I, I spoke about it the other day and these, these, result, these results coming up, these games coming up are crucial for Lee Johnson because he's, he's not bought himself any credit in the first part of the season. They're on a run of six, six defeats out of seven. You know, and that, that is relegation form, but it just takes one result to spark it. It might be Ibrox, uh, they've got Livingston at home, might be that game where you can go and get closer again to the teams at the top, but they've got a real hard run of games and they've got to pick up points. What do you think the score's going to be? I've got Rangers to win 3-1, Tam Cowens get Hibs to win 1-0 <laughs> because he thinks, obviously, Tam, that he spent such a lot of money on the uh, last season's defeat that he doesn't want to go and take everybody out again at the restaurant, you know. <laughs> and I know you two, um, <laughs> you know, you live in fear of having to pay everybody in the predictor. I just, I just don't think it's a, it's a great time for Hibs to go to Ibrox with the new manager coming in. I think it could have been better. I think if Van Bronckhurst was still there and they still had, you know, he was under pressure, then I would think Hibs could get a result, but I don't see it. I hope they get a result, I really do, but I think it ranges a win to nothing. I think Rangers will win. I think uh, I don't think there's any evidence really in the way that Hibs have played going into the break that would compel you to think that they're capable of going to an Ibrox ground that's going to be full of optimism. The the, the start of a a new chapter under a new manager. I think um, there's always a honeymoon period for a manager going in. I don't think you've seen anything about Hibs that would would lead you to think that they're capable of causing an upset. I think um, still still missing a good a good couple of key mm. players. Uh, I know there was a bit of chat about Aidan McGeady possibly being fit, but he's played so little football, even between now and then, that if he was to come off the bench or whatever, you think he's a player that could maybe conjure up something out of nothing, but on the whole, I just I, I don't see any evidence that Hibs are capable of taking anything from Ibrox. You can tell domestic football is due to come back because we always have a negative story that really we want to try and you know <coughs> completely and utterly distance ourselves from in, in society, never mind football. But Hibs have confirmed a racial comment was made during October's league game against Dundee United. This is a statement uh, that they put out today. Hibs uh, has continued to investigate the incident that occurred on Tuesday 11th of October in our Singe Premiership match at Dundee United. The audio from that incident was sent to an independent audio forensic expert who subsequently confirmed that the comment made by the individual at the match was racial. Uh, Hibernian uh, has a zero tolerance position on all kinds of racist and discriminatory abuse and finds that the behaviour completely abhorrent. It has no place at Hibs in the game or in wider society. Hibernian asked fans to come forward if they witnessed this incident so it can be dealt with a Appropriately, if the individual is identified, then the person will face the strongest action. It's, well, I mean, listen, fair play to Hibs for, for really taking this as far as they possibly could. You know, that's, yeah, that's the first thing that they've got. It's, it's came for the Hibs end, and it was at the one of their own players. Um, so they've got to find out who it was. Um, they've obviously went into it in more detail with the the audio description, um, and you're just hoping that some fan was there and heard it because it's absolutely appalling. It's all right, 
you know, giving your fans, you know, being frustrated by your own players, but to, to call them racist comments and, yeah. and the racial abuse at your own players is bang out order and let's hope Hibs find out who it was and they, and they don't get back into East Road ever again. Well, let's hope they do, but I think it's a very, very difficult one um, for prosecution or indeed identification. I think Hibs deserve credit for taking it as far as they possibly could. But this is one of those situations, Ali, where never mind identifying the person, is getting other people to actually stand up there and say in a court of law or indeed to, to any committee, this person is the one who did that because if you know, we've talked about it ad nauseum on this programme self-policing by fans is a tall it's a big call yeah I think it is a tough call I think though I think there's a, a shift in culture though I think probably more people have, have, have the courage of their conviction I think mo the, the vast majority of people would be appalled by it they'd be embarrassed by it I think when you, you do have significant numbers round about you that are, are voicing their disapproval of it, more people are likely to echo it. But I take your point. I think it can be very, very difficult to do at, at times. I would agree with you in terms of the club trying to condemn it in the in the, the harshest way possible because I think it's all that you can do. I don't think you, there's any other option. I think it's tiresome in this day and age that you're still having this kind of conversation. I think, it, you know, it, it, it's shocking to think yeah. that people can still be abused on the, the basis of the colour of their skin. I would like to think that it's a, a tiny minority of people, but you've got to keep educating, you've got to keep yeah. talking about it. And when the education doesn't work, then I think you do have to take action and say, you know, we're, we we are we don't stand for it, we don't allow it, we won't permit it. Um, and if, if we find culprits, then we'll deal with them accordingly. Gregor makes a point here, which I think is something that, that we've discussed before, which is we need strict liability. I think, that's, I think that's a tough call as well, because as you said there, you know, you're calling on it as something that is abhorrent and is something that we shouldn't have in society, but it'll never go away. You know, we have in this country a major problem with, at times, sectarianism. Never mind racism. Sectarianism has been something that's blighted, uh, you know, a, a, a harsh area, a, a, a really, an area in the west of Scotland which I think has suffered the most, but you still have it in certain areas across the country in sectarianism. But racism and people being abused, whether it's for their sexuality um, as well, all of these things will not leave Ali as long as you've got people who, and it's not it's not just about people who are not educated. Believe me. I think it's difficult. I think um, I think I, I I see the flaws in the argument for strict liability. I can appreciate them, but on the other hand. I think it, it maybe forces clubs to do something. I think clubs are very, very guilty at times of burying their head in the sand about sectarian singing. Yeah. I think the, the prevalence of it has been worse in recent seasons than at any time I can remember post-millennia. Yeah. I think um, I think there has been a rise in, in songs that I would think are inappropriate for football grounds. Yeah. Um, and I think the introduction of strict liability is, is not without its flaws but at the same time I think it forces clubs to admit that there's a problem to acknowledge it and to try and address it yeah um, I would say to you just to offer a, a counter on that is because of my age um, I have witnessed far worse um, in the in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s um, that was acceptable then um, and you know once you've gone from into the 21st century people have just tried to be more clever about how mm. the, you know how they can be racists and bigots um, but uh, it, it's something that I, I don't see going whether clubs have to pay the penalty as well only time will tell um, as far as uh, people who want to go to football to actually watch football and enjoy it and then just go home without causing anybody any harm whatsoever um, which is the normal people that you associate with Tam um, they're all talking about yes the football's back who's leaving who's staying uh, Gia Kamakis he, he had a five year deal that he signed with Celtic Clearly he feels as if he's scored, he's contributed, he's worthy of an extension or at least an improved contract. I think Celtic are thinking maybe, well, what are Celtic thinking on this one? <clears throat> well, it's difficult to tell. <clears throat> We're no privy to the, the contract talks at the minute. They could be miles apart, which appears to be the case. I think when you see him getting linked again today with mm. clubs abroad, a big money move to Saudi Arabia, for me, that is an agent at work. That is an agent trying to drum up interest in his client and try to eat more money out of Celtic. 
So whether that works or not, I don't know. Um, but not with the current board, <laughs> not, long yeah, not, not with the current board. But that's it's always it's always the case when people are yeah. contracts are getting you know. Like, well, agent, agent, agents want to get the best point? contract for does, their player. Does he have a point though? You got to go off our account. We don't know how we don't know how much money he's earning. You know, it, it could be miles off the top players at Celtic. He might have been promised something. He might have been. Um, he might have been promised if he'd done well. But is that in writing? So, yeah. <laughs> we don't know. There's a lot of contract talks going, and nothing's in writing. It's had that the spoken rally. word. <laughs> uh, so listen, we don't know, but I, I know something for absolutely sure that his agent will be touting him everywhere now to try and get either a better deal at Celtic or. A deal somewhere else. It's looking as if he, uh, both Djokovic uh, and Juranovic are the two red hot favourites to leave in the window. I think Juranovic, you can see why. I think Celtic have already sourced a replacement. You've got Alistair Johnson <coughs> in there, he, uh, 24 and a, an international player. He's not going to Celtic not to play. He's going to advance his career and make the next step in 18 months, two years' time to hopefully then move on probably to the, the English English Premier League. That's his, his reason for being in Glasgow. I, I think Juranovic has had an outstanding tournament. Uh, I think there will be no shortage of interest in him. I think Celtic will command a, 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 an excellent fee for him and it you know, it'll be excellent business all yeah. round given what they signed him for. You've got Italian journalists talking about uh, Torino for Juranovic. Yeah, they're, they're, and Atletico Madrid have yeah. been quoted a couple of clubs down south. I think he'll have options. Um, I think the World Cup was, was probably the best thing that could have happened to him in terms of just putting himself in the shop window and he, he's had a very successful tournament. Giacomacchus is a bit more interesting. Um, what I would say is that uh, Ange Postecoglou is entirely without sentiment. I think um, he's made it very clear yeah. that he has no uh, emotional attachment to players. He's prepared to to recycle all the time. Um, he's already warned supporters, don't get too attached to your favourites because there's a fair chance that no one is going to be here for too long because I'm continually looking to reinvest. So I think... Uh, I think he'll be quite happy for him to go. The, and the, ball's, I in, the ball's in Celtic's court. Isn't yeah, it? I read He's that. He's a long contract. Exactly. There's no rush for them. I read that story about Ryan, uh, the former Hearts player, Ryan, right back, what's his name? Uh, who, oh, Ryan McGowan. McGowan, who was on the plane <laughs> and, 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 and <laughs> Ange, next to him, Ange like, wouldn't talk to him. Now, eight hours or something. I don't know about you, uh, but if I was on the plane, uh, <laughs> you know, going with Ange Postecoglou next to me, I'd be annoying the life out of him, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I think, I, think about me, me, I played with Ryan at, uh, at United and uh, he likes to chat, but <laughs> I, think that, uh, that, I think that shows you a little insight into, into Ange as a person. You know, I think he was involved in a bit of, a bit of hassle with senior players or something, yeah. according to the story, and they, like, 14 hour flight never said one word to him and then just got off, and yeah. got off the plane. So when the game against Motherwell, Tam, I asked Ange Postecoglou if, you know, if he, you know, what happens when he, you know, he, is it difficult for him to actually just pick a team and know that there are certain people who are, who are not getting picked, you know, because obviously everybody wants to play. And he went, he just looked at me and he went, no, no, man, and I just put the team sheet up and that's bump. That's uh -huh. set. They like it, they like it, they don't, they don't, you know. I was going to actually give you the best Aussie accent that I could <laughs> there, but I'm just nowhere near it. I'm not good at it. Was Ange born in Wales, was it? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, hey, two lager and uh, Tam's on next. Um, <laughs> OK, uh, we will see if Giacomacus is heading out the door, but I can't wait to go up to Aberdeen um, for this one um, because thermals. I'm taking my thermals <laughs> with me. Ali has given me a bit of advice. Um, she's basically said... I, but I would wear the thermals and the thermal socks and I'm wearing the long johns but Ali Georgia bought, cold, don't know if Ali bought one of those waistcoats that's got the heater in it and the battery mm. so I've got, Amazon. I've got one of them I think, you, I think you can get them in the middle aisle of Lidl and Aldi as well as you can get everything in there but yeah. uh, at a certain do, age you don't need to worry about fashion, <laughs> fashion right. suits or anything well not like in that, Aberdeen by the way because it's uh, the only thing that's missing there is Richard Burton and Clint Eastwood singing Broadsword uh, broad broad calling Danny freezing. Boy it's it going to be freezing. freezing you won't be sorry that you're heated Julie <coughs> yeah, oh, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, Getting busy it. business yeah um, looking for a discount code off the Amazon isn't you <laughs> who Ali yeah. you can get it from lots so. of other people who deliver right. things by the way um, what about the Dons um, you know Jim Goodwin says the best is yet to come um, hoping obviously that they uh, you know can show that good home for them and cause Celtic a problem I was curious in the Press and Journal uh, this morning Dave Cormack talking about they're no longer going to be selling players on the cheap I mean, what, what, what were they? What, I don't think they sold. They sold anyone in the cheap. Were they shortchanged with the other deals? Were they were they not up to it? Were they incompetent in selling certain oh, players? Or are they just, as he points out, he says, look, we're just not going to let them run down their contracts. But 
They've had some players there that they've managed to get some good money for. They maybe McKenna not as ruthless. Ramsey. McKenna was the McKenna one. And Ramsey. Yeah, they're, they're Has it got to be more ruthless, there. I wonder? Uh, well, they've, got, they've reportedly got a new stadium to pay for, yeah. which they've got, seem to have the begging bowl out for with the council. But I think that... Um, no, I don't think they've sold anybody on the... I think they've, they've done good business over the last couple of seasons. Yeah. And they really they held Ferguson. firm, if you think, like Scott McKenna and, and Celtic were... Were, were interested in him and I think it was one of the January windows they really held firm yep. that they weren't that they wouldn't sell him uh, at, at any cost almost yeah. uh, before he went down south yeah I think they've, they've mm -hmm. well, we'll see if they, value if they're players I think sometimes they've got add-ons for Ramsey um, at an AGM and things like that I think sometimes you just you're almost throwing sound bites to an appreciative audience yeah uh, that's Ali uh, saying they're just basically <laughs> managers and chairman and chief executives sometimes economical with the truth <laughs> is that fair <laughs> or a little bit of PR spin uh, brilliant uh, Livingston uh, signed a Hibs player uh, no less uh, Stephen Bradley he was in as a trialist um, and they've got him in don't think a lot of Hibs fans are happy with that one. Um, I've seen Stephen play and he done really well for Dundalk last season. Played 30 odd games, played every week. Um, three and a half year deal we're giving Three and a half year deal, done really well in trials, scored a couple of goals in the in the friendly games. I think uh, he's used to playing on the AstroTurf because Dundalk play on a shocking Astro as well. So yeah. he'll be at home at Livingston. But I think when he goes there, you know, he gets in the team, he's still only 20 years old. I think that could be one. If he works hard, gets his head down and does well, that could come back and haunt Hibs because... I feel as if he was maybe due a wee chance coming back at Hibs, um, but maybe he's went into training and the manager's no fancied him for whatever reason, and that's just that's football. But that might come back and haunt Hibs in the future. That one. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've already given our uh, scoreline for Rangers uh, against uh, Hibs. Aberdeen one, Celtic three. I've got. What are you doing <coughs> for Ali? I've not put my. I've not put mine in oh, yet. Oh yeah, but you're last. Yeah. So Clearly she's waiting to. No, just you're being, to put you, it you really are turning into Ruffy by the way. You're just cheating all the way it's through a, the whole tournament. I was out for lunch with uh, Hugh, so I didn't have time to. Yeah. Submit well, Hugh submitted his. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. What about yourself, Tom? 2-1 uh, Celtic. 2-1 Celtic. Tight, yeah. um, okay. Uh, Hearts 2, Kilmarnock 1. 2-0 two no Hearts. We're going to talk about the Jambos and we'll be, we'll be out there at the AGM um, for Hearts uh, tomorrow and Kerry will be uh, getting the thoughts of the manager and players as well. Um, Livingston, uh, Dun United, I've got one nothing, Livy. 2-0 oh, no, Livy. Yeah, Ali. She's not done it yet. I'm not done it yet. Uh, don't, don't worry, don't worry about it. I'm just copy everything. Yeah, exactly. Motherwell 1, St Mirren 1. Oh. And we'll hear from the Motherwell manager. I think I've went for a draw in that as well. Ross County wants to draw. draw. One draw. Yeah. There you are. Um, listen, draws. quick one. Um, this has been released, obviously, over the course of the, the, the year. The Men's Player of the Year nominees. Um, this is the International Player of the Year. John McGinn, I think, won it last year. So fans can vote online for the Scotland Men's and Women's Player of the Year. Uh, it closes on the 22nd of December. Here, as you can see, are the nominees. Uh, give us your thoughts on it. Callum McGregor, Che Adam... Craig Gordon, Stuart Armstrong, John McGinn and Jack Henry. That's the men's one. Who are you picking? I'll go for McGinn. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to go for Craig Gordon. Yeah, I think I might be tempted by Craig Gordon. Just uh, the fact he's got himself back in as number one. But I think John McGinn might just edge it. Okay. What about the women's one, Ali? I'm going to give you the call on this because you've covered a fair bit of it. Uh, Abby Harrison, Caroline Weir, Erin Cuthbert, Sam Kerr, Sophie Howard and Claire Emsley. Caroline Weir would be the outstanding candidate there, I think. Erin uh, Cuthbert had a, a very good season last year too. Uh, got herself back into the Chelsea team, but you know I think Caroline Weir got the, the move to, to Real Madrid, um, playing Champions League football too. And I think she can be so key for, for Scotland. I think if she tends to play well, Scotland to play well, I would say the same for Cuthbert too, but I think Caroline Weir probably just edges it. Yeah, just before we go, the quiz answer, the answer is four. Um, how many uh, teams have gone on to win the World Cup after losing their opening match in the tournament? West Germany won, Algeria two in 1982. Uh, Argentina nil, Cameroon one in 1990. Uh, yeah. Italy nil, Republic of Ireland won in, in 1994, and 2010, Spain nil, Switzerland won. So there you have it, and of course Argentina have again uh, lost to Saudi Arabia, and they could be on the verge of winning 
another World Cup. So that's the answer. Um, thank you very much to everybody who has uh, obviously offered their opinion uh, on our feed. And thank you to everyone who actually has downloaded the PLZ Soccer app, which is proving really popular because you can watch the programme on your phone uh, and you can actually just absorb and, and relish some of the unique video content that we have on there too. One-to-ones, that game, special dream teams, it's all on the app and you get breaking news stories when they happen north and south of the border. Um, so all you have to do is subscribe to our PLZ Soccer YouTube channel if you get a chance. Uh, so many people are doing it in their thousands and I have to say, <coughs> you know, consuming not only the breaking stories in the uh, press conferences uh, but everybody thoroughly enjoying our football show as well and our competitions and there are bigger competitions on the way on the programme so hopefully you're enjoying everything that PLZ has to offer and I can tell you it's going to get bigger in uh, 2023 and uh, Tam is super excited about it he just hasn't told his face yet um, but join us if you can <laughs> Join us if you can. I'll get my motor for a heat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> thanks, in here. thanks to Ali. Thanks to uh, Tam. And uh, well, exactly. We can head down to Murrow and get yourself some hot soup with me. Um, thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. We'll see you tomorrow.